All right. Well, Teresa, I got nine o'clock on the dot here. I like to be respectful of everybody's time, so we'll go ahead and get started. I will be recording this, like I told Teresa earlier, for later playback. Uh, before we get started, I'll make an introduction to myself. I am Andy Sokolovich, the Vice President of the Clinton Regional Development Corporation. We are also joined by Erin Cole, President and CEO. She's somewhere here on these Teams uh, windows. And then we also have uh, Stacey Borgeson with us. She's our office coordinator. So we do these roundtables monthly. And we always try to bring in a guest speaker to shed some light on some topics that we may not be familiar with. And I guarantee some of you on the call uh, may not be familiar with a lot lobbyists so what a lobbyist actually does and why we retain a lobbyist under contract here in Clinton County to make sure that she's put in the best interest of the county forward. So again, welcome to the Clinton Region Business Roundtable featuring Therese Harms. I will be showcasing my screen for her slide deck and she'll be telling me when to transition, but I will be quiet now and turn it over to Therese. Therese, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Andy, and thank you everybody for having me today. I'm super excited. I love to get over um, to your neck of the woods and i um, always disappointed when I have to do this virtually, um, but appreciate the opportunity nonetheless. So, well, good morning and um, happy holidays to everybody. Merry Christmas. This is such a fun time um, of the year for everybody, um, but also very busy um, for us as we're pre preparing for the legislative session. So um, I want to just take an opportunity. Andy, if you'll go ahead and move on to the first slide or the second slide, technically. Um, I just wanted to kind of review the items that uh, I plan to talk about today, and those include an, in an introduction of who we are, uh, your government relations team uh, here in Des Moines and how we support the growth and uh, development of your local community uh, within the Clinton County region. Um, share the Grow Clinton County legislative agenda um, that we've worked on over the course of the last several months um, with your team uh, there and then uh, provide a little bit of an outlook on what we expect for the 2021 legislative session. So um, here's our team that um, is going to be working on your issues at the State House this next year. So um, myself and then Nick Laning is uh, new to our team this year, but he's going to be working on um, a lot of the economic development, transportation, um, local uh, government types of issues that uh, largely impact the your, your communities um, at large. So um, a little bit about advocacy strategies. So um, I've been in the business for 20, this will be my 26th legislative session. Uh, I started advocacy strategies 18 years ago. And so um, we've been around for, um, for, for a few years. Uh, and we have been representing Grow Clinton County for that we're going into our fifth legislative session. And so it's pretty exciting um, that we've had this long history and relationship and been able to accomplish some great things for, for your community. Um, you can learn a little bit more about our organization um, at our on our website, but just um, know that we, we are a multi-client uh, government relations firm and uh, we represent a variety of different organizations in addition to our, our previous work experiences and the things that we do every day. For example, I sit on my local uh, city council here in my community, um, gives me a different perspective of how um, we can engage and represent um, your community, um, particularly issues that pertain to local government. We're really uh, honed in on, on those types of issues but even more so um, as being small business owners and having been participating um, as a member of um, the Association of Business and Industry and Iowa Economic Development Corp. We work with uh, other organizations in the space and collaborate and partner with them on your behalf at the State House. So um, this is again, a little bit about our team, a little bit about, about our organization and uh, how we can, we can better serve you guys. Andy, we can go on to the next slide. Andy, you want to go ahead? Oh, we are there. <laughs> you should be seeing it now. So, yep, thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about Grow Clinton County's legislative agenda, and I'm glad Rich is on the um, um, program today, so um, he can, he and uh, maybe if Angela's on too, can correct me if I, uh, if I have any misgivings this morning. But um, so one of the things that we've done on behalf of the uh, Grow Clinton County uh, collaboration is to, I 
identify what are the priorities for the the community, not only in in how does it impact each one of the uh, the different collaborating partners, uh, so that we can best represent Girl Clinton County or the whole community at the state house. And um, so we've identified essentially these four categories um, of issues, and then we prioritize um, within those, but knowing that they cover a broad um, scope of, of issues. So um, as you can see, supporting local government sustainability. So one of the issues we'll be working on this uh, coming legislative session is the demo reserve. And um, that's basically ensuring that taxpayer dollars aren't being utilized um, to clean up the um, remains or messes that are left behind by absent landlords um, or people who have maybe lived and owned property in your community. And then when uh, those maybe have a disastrous situation, sometimes uh, property owners walk away and leave really the, um, the residuals hanging with the city or the county to clean up. Um, and that costs taxpayer money. And so one of the things we're trying to do is make sure that taxpayers aren't left um, holding the bill at the end of the day um, and that more proceeds are going um, to, to the community, back to the community to pay for those. Um, additionally, we, um, this has been one of, my, one of my favorite successes on behalf of Rural Clinton County is ensuring the property tax backfill continues. And so when the, the state engaged in property tax reform and uh, specifically commercial property tax reform, uh, it really did uh, cut revenues to local governments. And uh, one of the commitments that when Governor Branstad, which this was done um, uh, during his last administration, implemented this, he said, I'm going to make a commitment to make sure that the local governments are held um, harmless um, and won't need to, in essence, raise property taxes at the end of the day to cover this. So uh, they've they've ensured that state dollars come back on that commercial property tax um, component. And um, one of the very first meetings that I had uh, with the Grove Clinton County contingency that came to the state house in Des Moines uh, they sat down with Governor Branstad and then Lieutenant Governor uh, Reynolds and said, um, this is super important and we need to make sure that this continues to maintain, be a priority and you keep your commitment to this. And uh, Governor Branstad said, as long as I'm here, you've got my commitment. And uh, then Lieutenant Governor uh, Reynolds at the time said, as, as long as I'm here, you've got my commitment. And so um, the beautiful part about that is, is that it has continued and we're very proud. And I know that uh, in Girl Clinton County was one of the first groups to call out um, the, the governor um, and kind of hold the feet to the fire to ensure that that peace continued. And so um, it has and, and we're proud to have been a part of, of that component. Um, so those are a couple pieces. We're also um, continuing to work on anything that um, that deals with local government initiatives uh, that um, are in that space. So um, lots of, of different things that that touch in, in that area and that we continue to monitor, engage on on behalf of Grow Clinton County. Expanding mental health funding and services. So this is an area that the county. Some, yeah, Rich, go ahead. I just before we got off the back, Philip, there is a, a dead uh, drop dead on that, isn't there? I mean, how many okay. years does it last? Um, well, the you know what, Rich, I'll need to go back in and check on the specific timing of that. I believe it's in the mid 20s, some at some 20 something. Okay. Um, and so um, with the idea that it would drop because it's going to give time for the communities to be able to um, increase their revenues to cover that over time. And so I'm sure like most other things um, um, in government with um, when there are sunset clauses on items, they'll reassess at that point in time and then make a determination on whether or not it continues or um, there needs to be a change made um, um, at that time. So. Um, yeah, let's, let's talk about that further. Um, sorry for the interruption. I apologize. No, you're fine. I, great, great question. Um, expanding mental health uh, funding and services. So this is a, a um, has been a really important issue for Grow Gro Clinton County in particular because um, we're part of the um, Scott County Regional Mental Health uh, Services Delivery um, Region and. Um, 
Clinton County has essentially been picking up uh, part of the tab for the greater part of the region because the other counties are, are have met their max threshold for the amount that they can assess their taxpayers. Uh, and so um, it's it's kind of an unfair equation at this juncture. So we've been advocating for that, that um, funding formula to change. Um, and that has been a collaborative effort across the the state. It's not doesn't only impact um, our or your area, but it, it definitely impacts uh, across the state. And there are several counties, particularly the ones that are in the more metro communities um, or the urban the urban centers that are having these challenges. And so. Um, we're continuing to work. The governor did include last year in her invest in Iowa initiative to um, transition that mental those mental health dollars from property tax dollars to a state funded um, program. So replacing those, so which would in essence uh, provide a property ta property tax relief um, at the local level. And so um, that's an initiative that uh, the governor continues to support. Uh, we do know that she has intentions to um, uh, introduce the Invest in Iowa um, initiative again this next year, um, but she's getting some pushback uh, within the legislature at this juncture. So I'm happy to answer any questions about that, but that continues to be a priority for um, rural Clinton County and for a lot of different organizations for, for a variety of reasons. But addressing the mental health uh, funding shortfall um, has been a, a long uh, time issue and it's one that um, isn't going to go away until the legislature decides to address it. Promoting economic development in Clinton County. So this is an area that's the sweet spot for the, the CRDC. And um, this is one that we really appreciate everybody's um, feedback, particularly from this group to make sure that we are um, engaged and, and participating in all economic development um, uh, types of issues at the state house. Um, and so really support um, Aaron and Andy's feedback and Angela's feedback on, on these types of issues. So. Supporting the appropriate use of TIF has, has been making sure that TIF continues to be available for local communities for you guys to be able to utilize to recruit businesses to come in and um, and you know be good business partners locally. Um, and one of the uh, Andy sweet spot, and I see it in his background, is the home based Iowa program and um, supporting the military home ownership assistance program. I've I've uh, recognized you all as one of the uh, the golden child on how to best utilize this program. So um, I don't even think I've shared this with Andy yet, but um, I, I know we visited. I visited with Rich and, and Angela about it, but um, that I've I've had a conversation with uh, two veterans chairs, and um, we've we'd like. Um, uh, Andy to come in and present and share at the Veterans Committee meeting um, in the Senate and the House sometime in the first six weeks of legislative session to share how you maximize the program to recruit veterans back to Iowa. So um, Andy, by the way, that's on your to-do list. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm honored and I'm looking forward to it. And there's some more um, regarding that program too. One of the things that we've run into now, uh, not so much a hurdle, but something I like to navigate around would be how banks our local smaller Iowa banks can take advantage of that military home ownership assistance program because right now we have some that just don't have enough in the way of funding to support the program locally here and they're having to use some larger um, financial organizations to kind of springboard and allow them to use the program but if it truly is designed for communities and the attraction of veterans we should make it easier for financial institutions to participate. Okay, well, we'll have we'll have a conversation about that, and we can certainly engage the Bankers Association. They've been a great partner on a variety yeah. of issues, so we'll do that. Perfect. Dennis Lover has a quick question before you continue, Therese. Sure, Dennis. Thank you. Can you go into specifics as it relates to uh, the economic development, uh, the the use of TIF in particular, and then? Um, in addition to the banks that you talked about with the home base Iowa, uh, are credit unions actively involved in that or, or not? Uh, so I'll let Andy, I don't, I don't know about, so I, my role is to make sure that the dollars are available um, and, and we advocate for that piece as far as the implementation and accessing that. That's really an Andy question. Um, 
And so maybe I'll let you have a, um, a sidebar conversation with him about that. And specific to um, TIFF, one of the things that um, actually was probably about five years ago, um, there was a significant um, um, a, a initiative at the state house to eliminate uh, the availability and use of TIFF um, altogether and essentially to reform um, that. It continues to be um, an issue that comes up from time to time where a legislator will introduce a piece of legislation. A lot of it, I think, stems from they don't uh, they don't approve specifically of how maybe a local community has u- utilized TIF. Um, and so then they come and try to um, further regulate it um, at the state level. So there's been everything with doing away with it to um, you know, further regulating it. And so um, there are pretty significant regulations right now in the TIF space. Um, and obviously lo- all the local governments are familiar with how they can utilize that and or not utilize that. But I think we all recognize that it is a, a significant tool to help with business development and business and recruitment um, for businesses um, into a community. So um, what we're doing at, um, at the state house on that in particular is one is to make sure that it still continues to be a viable option for local governments and and um, and particularly in the economic development space and then um, um, essentially making sure it's available and doesn't doesn't go away doesn't get further regulated so it's not usable. And Therese, just to clarify for those that are not in the inner circle of economic development, that's tax increment financing, which again is just a tool that we use to incentivize businesses to move into our community. Thanks, Andy. Sometimes I forget that that not everybody does. So, I so do I. <laughs> Um, and then um, finally, enhance, um, enhancing educational opportunities for all Iowa students. And this has been your your school districts, your superintendents, your principals have been very involved in the Grow Clinton County organization and um, collaborative and um, really ensuring that adequate and equitable funding um, for for all public schools and um, community colleges. So supporting really which it what is your feeder program right for your uh, for your for your jobs locally and so making sure that the dollars are equitable um, over the years really the rural school districts um, haven't received um, equitable funding and so we'll we're working, one of the things we've been working on specifically, and actually Senator Knoyer has taken a, an incredible lead in this area. And now um, that she is the chair of the Education Appropriations Committee, um, I, I know that this is something that's um, on her mind and trying to figure out how to um, get, you know, more dollars in, um, you know, uh, at a quicker rate. Uh, to the to the rural communities, um, and this is something she shared with us when we we visited with her in, in um, I think that was October um, and November. So um, we'll continue to work beside Senator Knoyer to do our best to make sure that you know more dollars. We've been able to provide uh, the transportation equity dollars already, and we've met that. But we're, we're still working on the per pupil um, equity component. So. Um, so those are the categories, the issues that are going to be top priorities um, for, oh, you know what, that is, um, Andy, a wrong slide. So you can ignore that and move right through it. And I apologize that that is. No worries. Um, that is too. I wonder if I sent you a wrong slide deck. So, <laughs> um, or I just didn't delete enough of the slides so either way uh, it shows that you are extremely busy well (laughs) um anyway so um that's not the one i'm looking at so i think i probably sent you the wrong one um my apologies can you go to do you have one on there that says 2021 legislative outlook Right now, we're looking at the election update, so I don't know if you want to cover anything there for congressional seats, House or Senate. Um, then okay, we're looking yep, sure. At- here. I'll work off of that one. Um, so okay. that was the um, election. My apologies. Um, um, and so just real quick, so um, the um, election update, so we, we are still um, working on the, uh, or as looking at the 2021 legislative outlook, um, we we have a the Republican trifecta continues. 
um, in Iowa. Um, the I Iowa House Republicans grew their majority uh, uh, to 59. And so they picked up six seats in the Iowa House. Um, you um, in Clinton County, you guys still um, have uh, Representative Norlin Momsa and Representative Mary Wolf representing your your area. Um, so one from each of the, the two caucuses and you have Senator Knoyer um, in the Republican caucus in the Senate representing your, your region there. Um, the Senate majority right now is a 31 to 18 margin. Um, and you might say that doesn't add up to 50. Well, um, it's because the second congressional district is still uh, kind of hanging in the limbo, which is your congressional district. And so, um, as you know, uh, your former Senator Rita Hart um, has challenged the election results and that is going uh, currently through the process. So um, as that uh, um, unfolds, we will know whether or not current sitting Senator uh, Marinette Miller Meeks from Ottumwa um, if she goes to Congress, then um, her seat will open up and that'll be a special election um, that is largely a Republican yeah. area and um, uh, that is would likely still uh, be a, a Republican seat. So there, it'll probably be a 32-18, if I had to guess today, um, margin in the Senate moving forward for the next two years. Um, right now, Iowa's economy is uh, very strong. The REC met on the 12th of December and made recommendations uh, for a 3.7% uh, growth um, that will provide um, right around $350 million in new money um, coming into the fiscal year 22. So what's interesting about that in particular is um, um, most people are thinking that the Iowa's economy is not doing well, um, but actually it's uh, it's been very stable. We credit Iowa's uh, longstanding conservative approach and the fact that we don't allow the legislature to, uh, to appropriate more than 99% of our uh, projected state revenues in any one given legislative year. And so that's positioned Iowa, all of our um, economic recovery fund uh, balances are full and our rainy day funds, um, all of those funds are currently uh, very full and we're um, over $700 million um, in the um, in the black, if you will. So, um, and if you just wanna take that down, that does not, I think it, it, that's for the past, there we go. Okay. Um, and then one of the probably the biggest things is the pandemic um, clearly is a factor. We're really not sure how the legislative session is going to function moving into this next year. And because of that, um, um, largely the, the legislature is, is uh, not allowing uh, large events to happen. Um, and uh, really discouraging if you don't have to be at the state house for your day to day operations, then you probably shouldn't be there. And so um, we'll see how uh, the legislative session unfolds. We do understand that a lot of things are going to be available virtually and will probably function similar to how we did in June when we went back um, in to, to wrap up the legislative session. In conversations with legislative leaders, they're telling us right now that they will, um, they're gonna try to come in and get their work done and get out as soon as they can. So that's kind of what we're anticipating. The governor um, really encouraged her departments to not present any new issues unless they were COVID related or economic recovery related. So that's kind of what we're anticipating. The governor has two plans that are probably particularly important to the Clinton uh, region. Um, one is the Empower Rural Iowa plan with its recommendations, and then the, the state's economic recovery plan. So um, I'll send those over to Andy um, if he doesn't have them and share them because I think that they're critical components to um, what our legislative agenda is for Grove Clinton County. Um, specific to anything from workforce housing to child care availability, mental health funding, um, broadband um, expansion, those sorts of things. And then finally, um, the um, yesterday, the federal government um, passed um, another stimulus package. Um, and I think one of the things that we're hearing as we're uh, connecting with our colleagues and partners in Washington is that um, they're anticipating earmarking um, uh, types of activities that haven't been around maybe in a few years. 
um, with the Biden administration and maybe how things will move forward. And so as you have local projects for your communities, now is the time to be having those conversations with a congressional delegation. I know we don't know who your person is yet for um, uh, uh, District 2, but as soon as we do, um, it will be really important to have that conversation with those folks and then obviously be having conversations still with uh, Senator Ernst and Senator Grassley about what the priorities are for the local region um, and how the federal level, the federal delegation can help deliver some of those things um, home. Um, so one of the last things that I'll, I'll say and then certainly open it up for questions because I, I think I've been talking way too long today, but um, is um, Remember and know that we are an extension of your CRDC team, that Advocacy Strategies is here um, and we can help. If you have questions about issues that are going on at the State House or you want to connect with somebody about an issue or you want to, you have a priority issue that, that you don't know who to talk to about, um, we are a phone call or an email away. Um, we've helped a lot of different um, uh, groups and individuals locally um, kind of uh, manage the process and figure out how to uh, navigate around um, in and through the legislative process. So if that's um, something that you need assistance with, please let us know. And then know that we're collaborating and working with all of the other different um, economic development organizations um at the at the state house to ensure that um um you one your voice is heard um, we often get pulled in um because they're like okay thank goodness clinton county has and I, when i say clinton county uh, the community has um representation up here because then we can have a voice uh nora lynn and mary and chris are consistently you know uh in collaboration and communication with us to letting us know where we need to go um, and have conversations with their colleagues when they find it about some insider information that could be helpful to us and and um, representing your issues and and those types of things. So know that that we're here, we're we're a part of your team, we're extension of your family, and uh, we're here and ready to serve you guys moving into the new year. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Therese. Is there any questions? Anybody wants to just unmute themselves, you can ask. You can type it in the chat room. There's a handy dandy little raise your hand icon you can click on too if you're interested. And while we wait for the questions to roll in, I just want to say, you know, moving into 2021, um, I don't think there's ever been more important year to have representation at the state house since we're not able to attend. And, you know, I know that I get out and meet with our existing industries. And one of the things we want to make sure they understand is that we are working on their behalf in partnership with with organizations like Advocacy Strategy. So please leverage us as a conduit. Uh, Aaron, did you have anything else to add? No, I didn't. I mean, we've obviously benefited quite a bit from working with uh, Therese and her team and advocacy strategies. So we're looking forward to whatever 2021 is going to bring us. And obviously, I'm sure even if we don't go to Des Moines in person, we're going to work with Therese and her team to have a plan. We're still going to advocate for the issues that are important to us. So I look forward to that. I think Rich Phelan and, and uh, Angela Rangins for generally being our leads on these issues. It's really important for that. It's a lot of moving pieces. And as Trees lined out, you know, there are a lot of different issues that <clears throat> that Clinton County is obviously interested in. Not all of them touch on economic development, but for the economic development piece, you know, we see working with advocacy strategies as a huge benefit, not just for us, but for our investors. Absolutely. Mr. Phelan, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, it helps if I unmute. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think it's pretty obvious from what Therese said, but the Des Moines day scheduled for March, I believe 10 and 11, is probably most likely not going to happen, at least in the form that we've had in past years. Um, you know, Therese will give us a heads up if one or two of us or three of us need to jump in the car and head to Des Moines on a particular issue. But I don't think... Uh, I don't, I don't think you can uh, count on us being en masse in uh, Des Moines this year, so. Yeah, 
Well, there's a, a lot of things reflecting back on 2020 and the later part of 2019, you know, state funding that we've been able to leverage specifically through grants. I see Jennifer Walker of ECIA, our Council of Governments up in Dubuque is on the line, but our Keep Iowa Beautiful grant that we received has mm -hmm. been um, made a huge impact in the beautification of our riverfront, which was already a beautiful location here in the city of Clinton. But now with some concrete bump outs, permeable pavers, swing seating, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. And again, all of our partners really work together to ensure that we receive that funding so it doesn't all go on the backs of our municipal taxpayers. So thank you to Jennifer for being on the call as well. Yeah, Therese, this is Erin. I have a question too since I, um, I don't see any others at the moment, but you know, we also work closely with the Iowa Association of Business and Industry or ABI and um, I'm just curious to know, like when you're in Des Moines and obviously working on different issues and, and advocacy related, obviously, how do you interact with other types of organizations that are also focused on advocacy? Great question, Erin. Thank you. And um, that's one of the things that um, we've consistently done over the years. Um, and I think part of it is just my background and history with the organization in and of itself. I've, um, you know, having been a leadership Iowa member, but even as a, as a kid, I went through the Business Horizons program. So it's been a long, a long history um, um, in being involved with uh, folks like ABI, Greater Des Moines Partnership, the Economic Development Corp. Um, um, all of those entities, Joe Murphy has now left the partnership and um, um, gone over to the economic development group. And so um, there, these are, when you're at the state house, the, the kind of the lobby teams, if you will, um, even though people sometimes move from um, organization to organization, they kind of work on the same issues and in the same capacity. And so um, first of all, we see each other every day and look for opportunities to, to collaborate. Um, one of the first things um, when we, uh, during this COVID period is um, when we reach we reached out to ABI um, early and at the end of April once we started getting um, some of the um, COVID liability uh, language and so reached out to our our partners over there and shared with them the language that we had and then worked in collaboration with them to get that language introduced and passed at the state house um, for example. Um, but we're just consistently in communication on a day to day basis, whether it's, you know, at the state house or engaging in each other's, um, you know, communications. We try to read, um, you know, their reports. They, um, you know, we we look and, you know, see what types of issues, who's registered on what bills, um, you know, have conversations about how we can be um, helpful on those sorts of things. Not only the organizations, but there are key legislators too that are in that space that are consistently working to, um, you know, improve economic development policies. Uh, Senator Mark Lofgren, he's from the Muscatine area. Um, he's been a huge advocate in that space. Brian Losey is new to the House a couple of years. He just ran or just won his reelection, his first reelection um, in bon the Bondurant area. Um, he's going to be leading up the technology and uh, new new technology technology committee. And so um, he's really invested into not only the broadband, but, you know, greater how do we bring and get, you know, local or new business development in, in more rural communities, even though he's still kind of a part of the metro. Brondery, it's a small town and, you know, the big city. And so, um, um, so collaborating with all of the folks within that space and, and just communicating with them as we, you know, see them, whether it's, you know, he heading to a subcommittee or a committee um, where they're they're talking about the issues. So it's an ongoing uh, uh, collaboration with those folks. Rich, did you have something else, sir? No, I do not, Andy. That was yeah. It. Well, I did hear Therese, and this is my plug for Leadership Iowa. It's through the yeah. Iowa Association of Business and Industry, an amazing program. I uh, was lucky enough to attend in 2015. I wish I could go back through. I know we have some alums on today's call, but my charge to our Clinton County leadership is to ensure that we have somebody uh, from Clinton County, at least that we put in an application for it, represent us uh, each and every year. I know Angela is doing a phenomenal job this year. Unfortunately, she had to do it through COVID, which is rough because the best part for 
for me and maybe you, Therese, was the networking that followed after the session. So again, that's through the Association of Business and Industry, and it is called Leadership Iowa. I encourage you to look that up. It's a great program. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any additional questions. If you do want to send me those documents that you refer to, as well as your slide deck, and I will go ahead and make sure we send those out to those who participate in the call today. But uh, thank you so much, Therese, for taking your time. I am always excited to hear what you have to give us providing updates, and I do hope that we can come out there to the Capitol physically because I always geek out when I get to see everybody that I you know, normally see on TV, public television, walking around and have the opportunity to sit there and actually pick their brains. It's always a great opportunity for me, so thank you so much. Well, you are welcome, and um, again, I'm happy to all um, – make sure in the slide deck that my um, contact information is there. So if anybody wants to visit about anything, feel free to reach out um, or we're, we're again, always just a phone call or an email away, whatever kind of form of communication uh, you're interested in, we're, we're available and um, looking forward to a productive session, uh, despite it maybe being a little different than, um, than previous years, so. Yeah. No doubt. All right, everybody. Thank you again. My name is Andy Sokolich from the CRDC. I appreciate you participating in the December Clinton Region Business Roundtable. Look for the invitation coming up from January. Speaker to be determined. I have to call an audible on that one, so we'll see. But I'm used to calling audibles this year. 2021 is going to be a better year. Fingers crossed. All right. Happy Thanks. holidays. Merry Christmas, Hanukkah, the whole nine. I'll see you guys later. Uh -huh.